Well, friends, again, it is good that we could gather into this place. Uh, you are the early adopters. I appreciate that. Uh, some of you may have gotten up real early this morning uh, in anticipation of the alarm going off. I know that's always my case. Uh, I will uh, set my clock forward and I will wake up early before it goes off. And, uh, uh, but I woke up early today and uh, I fell back asleep and my alarm went off. Well, it was dark outside this morning, but it is good to be in this place. Uh, it's good to be home as well. I had the opportunity this week to, uh, to join other United Methodists from, uh, from this conference as we, uh, uh, we went down to, to Florida to uh, uh, just engage in a time of learning and fellowship, and uh, I appreciate that opportunity, and uh, my head is just so full of ideas and thoughts about uh, the church and how we continue to, to innovate, to reach out. Uh, to those who uh, are in the need of, of, of hearing the love of Christ. And I give God thanks for that. Um, I had opportunity as well to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, visit a little with, uh, with my grandson, which uh, I appreciate very much, but my grandson is one that uh, likes to share, and he shared a cold with me. And... Um, so I've been recovering from that as well. So if I'm hesitant to shake your hand today, you'll know why. Uh, I don't want to, uh, uh, to pass that on. Uh, someone said that's the love that keeps giving. Well, um, well friends, uh, today we're continuing on our series uh, called Chase the Lion. Uh, again, it's based on a book uh, by uh, uh, Mark Batterson. It's a uh, uh, I believe provides some great insight to us on, uh, on how we're to, to live our life in according to Scripture and, and to find some inspiration there for hope in the midst of difficulties. And um, uh, we've talked about uh, uh, the idea of running to the roar, that sometimes we need to turn around and we need to face our fears and and uh, run towards the roar rather than away from it. We talked about raising their spear against 800 to 1 odds that sometimes God calls us into those situations where the odds are against us so that God can be with us and that God will get the credit when things turn out. This weekend I wanted to talk about fighting for your dream. Fighting for your dream uh, until your hand freezes to the sword. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, uh, it's based on Scripture, on 2 Samuel uh, 23. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll, we'll get to there in just a minute. 2 Samuel 23. Around the, uh, the turn of the 20th century, psychologist Alfred Alder proposed uh, this sort of counterintuitive theory about compensation. He believed that uh, what we think of as disadvantages often prove to be advantages because they, they force us to create attitudes and abilities that probably would have lain dormant or, or gone undiscovered without those challenges. And it's as we compensate for those perceived disadvantages that we often discover some of our, our greatest gifts. What, uh, what, what most of you don't know about me is that when I was, I was younger, I was uh, absolutely uh, frightened to the point of just being paralyzed of public speaking. It was really difficult for me. I avoided speaking in public as much as I could. Uh, and I don't just mean in front of hundreds of people. I mean in front of just, uh, just about anybody. I was a very shy boy. And when I, I, I got to college, it didn't get any better than that. In fact, I, I put off taking public speaking until very much later in my college career. Uh, and uh, I was just absolutely frightened of it. Uh, 
And in that class, we had to do something that I had never done before. That is, we had to give our speech before our class. And it was recorded, and we had to sit down with the professor and watch it. Now, I don't know if you've ever done that before, but there's something extraordinarily frightening about that. Later on in graduate school, I, I would have the opportunity to, to teach and to lead some discussion sections, and, and these were the largest crowds that I had ever ta- uh, spoken with, and, and uh, uh, before that first class, I was just shaking. I could almost not speak in front of them. But you know, that was a perceived disability for me. And I shared with you earlier in this series that one of uh, the things that we can do to to fulfill our dreams is to to overcome some of those fears, to unlearn our fears. And this is one of those fears that I had to unlearn. Who knew that when I was a child and a very shy child that I would be one who would be sharing the Word of God in public like this? It was not the most comfortable thing for me. Friends, we have gifts and abilities. You have gifts and abilities that you aren't even aware of. But they're often buried beneath your perceived disadvantages. And in those disadvantages, your dreams are sort of playing hide-and-seek there, I believe. What does that have to do with, with this series? What does it have to do with David and his mighty men? Well, I want to zoom in and, and paint a picture of you, uh, paint a picture for you here. Saul, Saul and his men, they, they slept in the palace. While David and his mighty men ran around sleeping in caves. Saul's army was well equipped. They had the latest technologies. David's army, not so much. Benaiah had to snatch the Egyptian spear to use it against him, right? Saul's army ate a feast, served on silver platters every night in the palace. David's men had to hunt and kill everything that they ate. What I'm saying is that they were at a supreme disadvantage. Or were they? They had to work harder. They had to grow stronger. They had to get smarter. David's mighty men seem to be at a disadvantage, but that's how God makes heroes. For Joseph, the disadvantage was 800 to 1 odds. For Benaiah, it was a 500 pound lion. For Eleazar, it was the rest of the army retreating and leaving them behind. But it was those disadvantages that set the stage for God to do something supernatural. And that's where we pick up the story in 2 Samuel 23, beginning with verse 9. And the words will be on the screens before you as well. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai the Ahite, as one of the three mighty warriors. He was with David when they taunted the Philistines, gathered at Postenum for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What I want to share with you this morning is is how you might fight for your dream. And believe me, if if it's a God-sized dream, you're going to have to fight for it. Dreams don't come easy. First, I, I, I think you have to define what it is 
what success is. Like, and I, I want to start there. We're, we're talking about fighting for a dream. That dream. It better be a dream that's worth fighting for, right? Because if we succeed at the wrong thing, we have failed. Right? If we succeed at the wrong thing, we still fail. And I think if we fail at the right thing, then in that we have succeeded. I, I don't know about you, but I, I would rather fail at the right thing than succeed at the wrong thing. And I have a, a simple definition of success. And by the way, if, if, if you don't define success for yourself, right, probably what's going to happen is that you're going to allow our culture or someone else to define that for you. Here's my definition of success. Success is when those who know you best respect you most. Success is when those who know you best respect you most. It's not that complicated. Eleazar figured something out. He figured out what he was willing to die for. We need to know what battlefield we're willing to die on, friends. And we have to stop living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. We need to run to the roar. Friends, we don't die when our heart stops beating. We die when our heart stops skipping a beat in pursuit of the dream that God has put in our heart. But we, you know, we have to know what it is, what that dream is. Every one of David's mighty men were willing to fight because they had a clearly defined goal, and that was to crown David king. That was their dream. They knew what they were going after. The last couple of weeks, I, I've given you some, some definitions of faith. And I, I know that all of you remember them, right? But here they are again, in case you don't. Faith is the willingness to look foolish. Faith is the process of unlearning our fears. Faith is taking the first step before God reveals the second one. Let me give you one more this morning. This one may sound familiar to you. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's Hebrews 11 and 1, in case you were wondering. I, I, I think it's the best definition. And I think fighting for your dream starts right there. You have to know what you're fighting for. And I think Jesus is the epitome of this. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, the scripture says. How do you endure surf, su suffering on a cross? How do you do that? How do you endure that pain? You do it because you have a vision of what you're doing it for. Friends, he endured suffering on the cross because of a vision that he had of you and of me. A vision that we, all of us, would be reconciled to God. He went to the cross for our salvation and, friends, he was willing to die for it. Success wasn't overthrowing the Roman Empire. That's what most of the Jewish people wanted him to do. But he knew that wasn't the end game. That wasn't what it was all about. It wasn't about earthly kingdoms or kings. This was an eternal thing for Jesus. Right out of the gate, we have to define what success is, friends. The second thing, I, I think we have to take it one step at a time. Our dreams are like boxes of Legos. You know, I, I believe that. You know, if, uh, if life is like a box of chocolates, dreams are like a box of Legos. I loved to play with Legos as a kid, and I wasn't that creative with them. That's not what I like to do with them. 
I like to look at the box and then I like to follow the step-by-step -step directions to put the thing together to make it look like the picture on the box. I was pretty good at that. I wasn't so good at creating new things. And sometimes putting those Lego bricks together step by step there were more than a hundred steps to get it to look like a car or whatever sometimes friends you have to go through a whole lot of steps in pursuit of your dream friends it's going to be a multi-step process to fulfill the dreams that god gives you it's not going to happen overnight we're going to overestimate what we're going to do in a year we're going to underestimate what god can do in 10 years it's going to take longer and it's going to be harder but it's a process we are a process and honestly even more importantly than accomplishing the dream is who we become in that process in pursuit of our dreams, friends, we change. We become something different than when we began. So I want to encourage you this morning not to despise the process, but to live into it. We may want fully assembled success, but the truth is there are no shortcuts. If there are bricks left over, friends, You've taken shortcuts. That's how it is with most things in life. You get in shape, you know, one workout at a time. You get out of debt one paycheck at a time. You earn a degree one class at a time. That's how things work. Number three, get around the right people. Now you might say, well, who are the right people? The right people are the ones who are going to support you and help you and to walk that journey with you. It's a tiny little proposition, but it has huge implications, right? What does it say in 2 Samuel 23? It says, Eleazar was with David when they taunted the Philistines. You could say he was in the right place at the right time with the right person. Let me just say this. It's not about you. Your dream isn't about you. It's not about me. It's about God's glory. But I'm also going to tell you that God is setting you up. He wants to leverage you for His kingdom purposes. And part of that is getting around the right people. I said this uh, uh, week one. One of the best ways to discover your dream is to serve somebody else's dream. Friends, if you'd say that you don't have a dream, I'd say get around a dreamer for a while. And it won't be long until something contagious happens, like a cold. <laughs> right? I see it in Scripture, don't you? Joshua climbed Mount Sinai with Moses. Elisha shadowed Elijah. Ruth would not leave her mother-in-law's side and their loyalty paid dividends. Joshua took over for Moses. He led the people into the promised land. Elisha got Elijah's mantle. Remember, he asked for a double portion. I don't think if Elisha doesn't hang out with Elijah for years and years, I don't think he has any ground to stand on to ask for the double portion. Is it any wonder then that he doubles the output, right? He performed twice as many miracles as Elijah did. Then Ruth gets a second chance at love by marrying Boaz, and they had a boy, right, named Obed, who had a boy named Jesse, who had a boy named David. See, Ruth becomes King David's great-grandmother because she was with Naomi. You have to get around the right people. You have to choose your friends wisely. I think one of the best ways to do that is to get involved with ministry and with study within the church. Now, I'm not saying that we should just uh, isolate ourselves. Far from that, friends. We're to be out in the world. But we need people in our life that will support us 
as we grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And that will allow us to go out to befriend those and to share with them the love of Christ. So get around the right people. Number four, adopt a growth mindset. Adopt a growth mindset. Let me share a personal conviction. I believe that just about anybody can do just about anything if they work hard enough, long enough, and if they work smart enough. I mean, there are some physical limitations that might restrict us from accomplishing something. I understand that. But I really believe that anybody can do just about anything if they fight until their hand freezes to the sword. If they're willing to devote their lives to something, look out. I've seen this happen time and time again. I served a congregation where I, uh, there, there was a woman who approached me uh, uh, the, the first week I was there. And she says, I have a dream, I have a vision for creating uh, an exchange co-op here in this town. I said, that's great. Let's pray about that. She says, I've been praying about it for years. I said, well, just let's continue to pray for that. And you know what? She got around some people. She shared her dream, and they got together, and before I left, they had created a co-op in that town. She had fulfilled that vision and that dream of doing something. And she was willing, she was willing to fight for it. I mean, there were all sorts of challenges to that. In 1939, Finland Finland was a huge underdog in the war, the Winter War. The Soviet army was three times larger with 30 times as many aircraft, 100 times as many tanks. But the Finnish troops held their ground, much like Eleazar held his. And in 1940, Time magazine ran a feature on the Finns. And it turns out that they have something that they call Saizu. It's a, a compound of, of bravado and bravery, uh, bravery, of ferocity and tenacity. Any of you have finished blood? Right? It's the ability to keep fighting after most people have quit and to fight with the will to win. The Finns translate Saizu as the Finnish spirit. But it's much deeper a word than that. It's an inner strength. Saizu is the will to fight. It's the unwillingness to give up or to give in. It's fierce resolve. It's guts. It's grit. Eleazar had Saizu, friends. He wasn't willing to give up. In her book called Mindset, Carol Dweck makes a distinction between two mindsets, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And basically, a fixed mindset believes that your qualities are fixed in stone and that you can't do much to change it. A growth mindset believes that your basic qualities can be cultivated through effort. Like I said a few minutes ago, anybody can do just about anything if they try long enough, hard enough, and if they work smart enough. I'm not saying that they can do it out of their own strength. I'm not saying that they can do it on their own. Maybe they need to get around people who can do things with them. But friends, a fixed mindset tries to validate itself. And it's always on trial. A growth mindset tries to stretch itself. And it's always learning. A fixed mindset is focused on outcome. And that's key here. A fixed mindset is focused on outcome. A growth mindset is focused on inputs. With a fixed mindset, when you fail, you're a failure. It becomes your identity. With a growth mindset, when you fail, it was a failed attempt. See, there's a difference there. You can use that failure to grow from it. 
I think that's true of success. You look at people that you admire, and, and honestly, we want the success, don't we, without the sacrifice. We don't necessarily want to go through what they went through, but we'd love to be where they are, right? We'd love to be able to have that success. Now, friends, this is not self-help or go out and work harder. That's not what I'm trying to present to you. This is the Holy Spirit's help. This is a stewardship issue. God has given you time and talent and treasure. Potential is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift back to God. Do you get that? Potential is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift back to God. And friends, you have to fight until your hand freezes to the sword. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He walked out of a tomb and said, let's get going. His kingdom is going to come. His kingdom is near. His will is going to be done, friends. The question is, are you going to work with it? Is your dream in line with that? Friends, I want to encourage you, don't run away from 800 to 1 odds. It's easy to sit and listen to that. Fight until your hand freezes to the sword. What does that mean? I understand we get tired. We have bad days. But at the end of the day, I just think we have been given a command to charge, to play offense with our lives and not wait around until we die. God has given us life and breath. And He gives the Spirit to lead us and to guide us and to direct us. Friends, none of us can fulfill our dream on our own. There's work to be done. There's kingdom work to do. Now, I don't know exactly what your dream is or or what you're chasing or what fear you need to face. I don't know what 500-pound lion you need to face or hundreds of steps you need to take to get it done. But I want to encourage you today to fight for it. With God's help, fight for your dreams. It's not easy, but that's what God has called us to do. I I think you have to charge your dream. At some point, you have to take that step of faith and say, even if I fail, this is a dream worth going after because I can look at myself in the mirror and if I know that I gave God everything, then I'm fulfilling that dream. I really believe I really believe you can say that God was calling me to do that. And friends, may God help each of us to fulfill the dream that he calls us into. We can't do this on our own. It's better to walk with somebody as we grow into the likeness of Christ. And it's also better not to pursue our dream out of our own strength, but to rely upon the strength of God. Because in the end, when we succeed, God gets the credit. Let's pray today. God, we offer ourselves to you. Lord, we pray that you'd speak to each and every one of us the words that we need to hear today. Lord, for some, it's a matter of salvation. Lord, for others, they are at a place of discouragement. Because, Lord, it's taking longer, and it's been harder. And, God, I pray that you would remind us that sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is hang in there. Hang in there a little longer. And fight for what we believe in, Lord, till our hand freezes to the sword. So God, encourage us today. 
reveal to us those next steps that we can take so that your kingdom can come and your will can be done. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.